reading of the word of the living God, John chapter 3 and verses 1 and following. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ did not say you have to be baptized to go to heaven. He said you must be born again. He did not say you have to be a Baptist to go to heaven. He said you must be born again. He did not say you have to give money to go to heaven. He did say you must be born again. So if that is the must, if that is the imperative, then we need to understand what it means to be born again and how everybody here this morning can be sure that you've been born again and you're on your way to heaven. The simplicity of salvation. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, your courts with praise. We're thrilled that you're alive. And I pray today that those who know about you will meet you personally. I pray Acts 26, 18 to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. And I pray that this day will be the day of transformation and regeneration of the lives of many. And in advance, we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been in church much at all, you've probably heard the verse John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You may have heard the verse, do you know its setting? That was the climax of a conversation between Jesus Christ and a man we meet for the first time in the Bible named Nicodemus. Verse 1 tells us his credentials. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees. Paul's there for a moment and realized Pharisees were the most religious people alive at that time. How religious. They fasted two days out of every seven, gave 10% of everything they owned, had Bible verses written in their clothing. If you fast two days a week and give 10% of everything you want and you have Bible verses in your clothing, would you stand? Nobody ever does and nobody ever can. Uh, these people were the most religious people probably who've ever lived. So Nicodemus was a religious man. His name means the people's victor. He was a respected man. Everybody knew him. The Bible says he was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was highly educated and a ruling man. And history tells us the Pharisees were rich. Now you put together the fact that he was respected, a ruler, he was rich, and he was a high and mighty religious man. You'd ask yourself the question, what more could you want? But notice his curiosity. He comes to Jesus by night. He knows there is something missing in his life. You may be religious today and something's missing. You may be respected today, but something's missing. And so Nicodemus sneaks off so some of his cohorts won't see him. And he goes to Jesus and wants to talk to him about his teaching. Jesus cuts to the chase. Notice his confrontation in verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. Let's all say that phrase today. Here we go. Born again. Now notice Jesus did not say you must be Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, or Baptist. He did not say you must have communion, confirmation, or catechism. He didn't even say you had to be good. He said if you're going to heaven, you must be born again. Look at the confusion in the life of Nicodemus who says, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? He's saying, You're telling me that as a senior citizen, I'm going back inside my mother and come out a second time? See the loving correction of Jesus in verses 5 and 6. For Jesus said, except a man be born of water, there's one birth. And of the Spirit, there's the second birth. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. He goes on and explains, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He speaks of two births. He said there's a water birth or a fleshly birth. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you have had that. Years ago, we were carried inside mom, 
in an amniotic sac with liquid, air, water broke, we came into the world, that's how you got here. If you have not had a water birth, you're not here, you just think you are. Everybody that's here today has had a water birth. Interesting, isn't it? It was a miracle. You did not slip up on your mother and notify her that you'd arrived. Long before you knew there was a you, she knew there was a you, and it was a gift and a miracle. It was an earthly life. That's how you got here. But Jesus said you must have a second birth. That too is a miracle. It's not what you can work up or pay out. It is what is sent by Almighty God. So he says to you, one birth will get you here. That's a miracle. But it takes a second birth to get you into the kingdom of heaven, and that is a second miracle. The issue today is not have you had the first birth. You have. You're here. The issue is you must have the second birth in order to see heaven, step in heaven, or live in heaven. And that's the word of the resurrected Jesus. Now, were I sitting here this morning, I'd have some things going through my mind. I would be asking a question, what's wrong with my first birth? And if I have to have a second birth, what is it going to cost me? You say, preacher, are you analytical? I'm quite analytical. So if I were sitting where you are, I'd want some answers. Years ago, my wife and I had just been married. We were living in a little trailer in South Carolina. The thing was so small, you had to go out to side to change your mind, if you understand what I mean. It had linoleum on the floor and my feet stuck in the winter time and I told my wife, we are putting some carpet in this place. She said, honey, we can't afford tuna fish and macaroni and cheese, how are we going to buy a carpet? I said, the Sears installment program. Sears will make it and I'll install it. Now this was years ago when you could buy squares of carpet in a box, some of you now know how old I am, and you peeled off the back and stuck it down. So every week we would buy one box of carpet and I was a carpet layer. We finally had enough carpet to carpet the entire little trailer except for under the, under the couch and we put boxes up under there and nobody knew the difference. No longer, no sooner did I get that carpet in, there was a knock at my door a few nights later. A man with a box and a big smile on his face said, my name is and your name's been given to me and I've always been polite and so I invited him in and found out the moment he got in the house he was a vacuum cleaner salesman. Has he been to your place? Well, he sat down, began to tell me about his vacuum cleaner. He took it out with the description. I figured it would start itself and just automatically clean the carpet. He did something that offended me, however. He undid a unzipped a pouch that had dust and dirt and lint, and he shook it out all over my new carpet. Now, I'm normally a pleasant person, but I was thinking under my breath and kind of mumbling myself, buddy, if you, your vacuum cleaner does not get that up, you're going to eat that. This is new carpet. Well, finally, after he described his vacuum cleaner, he turned it on. It had so much suction, I was no longer worried about the dirt coming up. I was worried about my carpet coming up. And he was really a salesman. I had some questions, and my first question was basically, what's wrong with my vacuum cleaner? It may not be as good as yours, but at least it rearranges the dirt. And then I thought, well, I wonder how much this thing is, and then is there any guarantee or warranty that comes with it? You say, preacher, what's your purpose in saying that? I had questions. I'm not here to sell you anything today. Salvation is a gift it's already paid for. But if I were sitting here and somebody said to me on a Sunday morning, you have to be born again. You can't go to heaven unless you're born again. You can't see heaven or step in heaven. I'd want to know what's wrong with my first birth. It's okay if I don't get born again this morning, so what? And if I do want to be born again this morning, what does it cost? Let's answer as quickly as we can these questions from the Bible. Take your Bible, please. Turn to the book of Romans. If you're not familiar with it, hang a right and go through the book of the Acts and come to chapter 3 in Romans. Question number one, what's wrong with my first birth? The Bible answers, look at verse 9. What then are we better than they, know in no wise? We before prove both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under, everybody say the word please. According to the Bible, would you answer me this morning, how many people are under sin? Look at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Would you look this way? 
according to the Bible, the Bible that God wrote. How many good, righteous, wonderful people are there? Verse 23. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, according to the Bible. How many people have sinned? You answer. Here's three verses. I could give you 300 that conclude and tell us all. When you and I were born, we were born in sin. Romans 5, 12, for as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The reason you and I sin is because we were born sinners. You do not become a sinner because you sin. You sin because you were born a sinner. If you read your Bible in Genesis chapter 3, you remember the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. You remember they were forbidden to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they disobeyed or sinned against God. Because of that, they physically died. They spiritually died. It took the miracle working grace of God in order to give them eternal life. Because we're their descendants, we were born in sin. The word sin means to miss the mark. It means to offend God. It means to disobey God. And everybody in this building, including this preacher, was born a sinner. My father was a pastor. But pastor's children are sinners just like drunkard's kids. It makes no difference to God. Some years ago, I was preaching in New York, a wonderful place to preach. Has all kinds of nationalities. A Korean woman came to me upset with my preaching. She came and said these words. Now, you can't go around the country condemning everybody. I said, ma'am, I'm not condemning anybody. If you heard what I said, I said, we're all sinners. She said, but you don't know me. I said, no, ma'am, but God does. And I'm just telling you what God said about all of us. And she looked at me and she said, that's not fair. And I explained again, Adam and Eve. And then she said something I had to write down because I'd never heard anybody say it. She said, now let me get this straight. Two people I've never met who live someplace I've never been have got me in some kind of trouble I can't get out of. I said, well, you're accurate, but you can't get out if you know the door and Jesus Christ is the door. She said, I just am having a hard time with that. I said, ma'am, may I ask you a question? Are you Korean by birth or American? She said, Korean. I said, I notice you have jet black hair. She said, I was born that way. I don't ask every woman. I don't know which Clairol she's been on, but I figured that was safe. I said, I noticed that you have olive colored skin, trait of my people. I said, you have dark eyes. That's what my people are like. I said, did you ever get up one morning and say, this is not fair. I wanted blonde hair. I wanted blue eyes, a different color tint in my skin, and I wanted to be born in America. And she looked at me and said, are you okay? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I'm just fine. Would you answer the question? She said, what good would that do? This is the way I was born. I said, interesting, you've never been mad because of your physical traits which you inherited. But I showed you this morning spiritual traits that you inherited, and you've been mad at me ever since. Now, ladies and gentlemen, nobody gets born again until you understand the reason. The reason is sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Galatians 3 and verse 22, the scriptures conclude all under sin. And so the Bible explains the reason we have to have a second birth is because of our first birth, we were born in sin. Second question, so what if you don't get born again? Take your Bible, go over to the book of Romans in just a couple of chapters to chapter 6. And look please at verse number 23. Romans 6 and verse 23. I hope if you have a chance, you'll go to the pastor's class. My wife and I and my son and his wife went there today. Some of the very things I'm giving to you, he gave in the pastor's class. Now listen carefully. What if I don't get born again? Look down, please, at verse 23. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is, everybody say it, death. The word death in the Bible, good friend, does not mean annihilation. If somebody told you that when you die, you're going to be annihilated, they lied to you. The word death in the Bible means separation. There is a physical separation when you die, your soul comes out of your body, your body is buried, but your soul is separated from your body. You do not hear, see, you do not think, you have been separated from your body. We're all facing that. But there is a second death, and that is when your soul is separated eternally from God. Revelation 20 and verse 15 says, Whosoever is not found written 
in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Listen to it. This is the second death. So the Bible teaches this. Everybody has a soul. One of these days, your soul will be separated from your body. But if your soul has not been born again, then your soul must be separated eternally from God. Why? Because of sin. Revelation 21, 27 says, there is nothing that enters heaven that will defile it. That means, good friend, if you die in your sin, you cannot get into heaven. Not one single solitary sin of any man, woman, boy, or girl will ever enter the presence of a holy God. Somehow you've got to get rid of your sin because if you do not, then you must be separated eternally from God in a literal place that God calls hell. Preacher, is there a hell? Listen to the Bible as I quote Luke 16, 22. The rich man also died and was buried. There's his physical death. And in hell, he, the same man, lifted up his eyes, being in torments or torture. He seeth Abraham afar off Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented. Hear him now in this flame. Abraham said, son, remember, thou in thy lifetime had that good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed separation so that they which would pass from us to you cannot, neither can they come to us that would come from thence. Ladies and gentlemen, God Almighty said, if you die in your sin, you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, you must go to a Christless place called hell. You say, preacher, what about purgatory? Good friend, I'll be here all week long. I'm offering a million dollars to anybody that can find one, just one verse anywhere in your Bible that proves a literal place called purgatory where you go after you die. You stay for a period of time, get your sins purged. You come out and are ready for heaven. It is not taught anywhere in the Bible and was not taught by the church that teaches it until the 1400s. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a heaven, God wants you there. There is a hell and God does not want you there. If you die in your sin, you'll be alive, awake, and aware for eternity. You will be tortured in the torture chamber of the universe. But I remind you that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb so that you would not have to be damned but delivered. So that you would not have to go to hell but to heaven. And because he lives, you can also live because of what he's done for you. Years ago I was preaching and a, ex, and a big cop walked up to me, put his hands on my shoulder. He said, I want to tell you a story. I said, I'm all ears. He said, my buddy and I were called to a one car collision. He said, when we jumped out, the car was already burning. He said, my mind said, I've got to rescue this guy. I could hear him screaming. He said, I took off for that car. My buddy tackled me. The car exploded. He said, now we see people die, but I had never seen anybody die like that. He said, Brother Farrell, I want you to know that I went home that night. I went to bed, but I woke up in a cold sweat. He said, for one solid month, I woke up every night and I could see the explosion. I could hear the man screaming. I could hear him say, I'm in hell, I'm in hell. And then with all sobriety, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said these words, please do this. When you preach on hell, tell him for this cop, don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. I'm not just telling you for that big cop. I'm telling you on the basis of the word of God. Don't go to hell for your religion. Don't go to hell for a relative. Don't go to hell for something you think is fun. Don't go to hell when you can go to Jesus and have forgiveness of sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but watch the rest now, verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life. Here it is through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what the Bible says? You have a penalty. You have a payment. You have a destiny. But you can skip all that if you'll come to Jesus Christ and he gives you eternal life. It's a gift. Everybody say the word gift. Here we go. Gift. Say it again. Gift. It comes not through Mary, 
It comes not through the Pope. It does not come through the pastor or the evangelist. It does not come through the church, communion, or catechism. The Bible is very plain. It comes through Jesus Christ the Lord. You see, he is the only one who died for you and was buried for you and raised again for you and came out of the tomb alive. Think about it. Only a living, eternal God can give you eternal life. That gift was paid for six hours one Friday. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. There is not a sin that you've committed that Jesus Christ cannot cancel and completely cleanse, but you must come to him and him alone. Now, if he has provided the gift, how is it that you receive that gift? Take your Bible, please. Go to the Gospel of Mark, which is the second gospel in the book in the New Testament. And look, please, at chapter 1. In a few moments, I'm going to close this service. And I want you to know that everybody in this building who is not certain that you're going to heaven can be born again. But I want you to understand how to be born again. Now, in Mark chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 14, after John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, I'm in Mark 1, 15, hear the words of Jesus. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You're a wonderful crowd to preach to. I've been looking upstairs and down, and I've noticed that you've given wonderful attention. Please do not miss what Jesus said must happen if you're going to be born again because you can miss heaven if you do. Jesus said you must repent. Now, he did not say do penance. That's what you pay. He said repent. Jesus is the author of salvation. He's the one who sets the standard. He's provided the gift, and therefore he gives the guidelines. What does repent mean? It is the word to change your mind. You've been trusting baby baptism. Guess what? No baby in the entire Bible ever got baptized to go to heaven, including you. You've been trusting confirmation. Guess what? There is no confirmation in the Bible anywhere. You've been trusting communion. Understand, it's not communion. It's the Lord's Supper. Jesus never said you were receiving him. 1 Corinthians 11 says you're remembering him. If you thought you were receiving Jesus when you swallowed bread or the cup, you're wrong. Jesus did not say that. He said, this do in remembrance of me. You've been trusting a denomination, but there are no denominations in heaven. You've been trusting a work that you've tried, but Titus 3, 5 said, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So you're on the wrong road. Now you've got to change your mind. Now, good friend, you may be out on 40 East, sincerely hoping to go to Asheville, North Carolina. But if you understand directions and you have any common sense, you can stay on 40 East, but you'll never get to Asheville because that's on 40 West. When it, when it comes to your mind, I'm going the wrong direction. You need to make an exit, you need to turn around, and you need to go on 40 West. Now here's what Jesus is saying. When it comes to your mind as it is on Easter, that you've been trusting the wrong thing, you've been trying to get to heaven on your own, change your mind. You can't change your life, change your mind. Just simply say baptism, catechism, confirmation, going to church, doing my best does not work. I changed my mind in Luke 13, 3 and 5 says, except you repent, you'll perish. You can leave this morning and disagree with me. I am not the author of salvation, but if you leave this morning and disagree with God, then you leave this place on your way to a Christless hell when God wants you to go to heaven. Jesus said, repent. And then he said, and believe. Now, he didn't say repent to believe or repent or believe. He said repent and believe. Whereas you've been trusting things you have been doing, now you change your trust. And you transfer all of your trust away from what you've been doing to the one who's trustworthy, Jesus Christ, the risen Son of Almighty God. When you come to him, you come by faith. You do not come and say, if you're there, that's not salvation. You do not come and say, well, I'll try your way because I've tried other ways. That's not salvation. You transfer all that you've been trusting in to Jesus Christ, and first you must believe that he is God. You see, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. 
Now, good friend, a man said to me one time, I believe I'm going to heaven, but I don't believe Jesus is God. And I said to him what I'll say to you, you're not going to heaven. For if Jesus Christ is not God, he's a liar. If he's a liar, he's not even alive because the whole thing is a hoax. The Jesus you trust is not the one of your making. You must trust the Jesus who made you. He is God. There is no other God. And you must believe what he did for you, so please don't miss this. He died for your sin. He was buried for your sin. He was raised the third day to justify you. Now hear me carefully. You can say Jesus died and was buried and resurrected and never go to heaven. You say, why not? The devil believes that. That's historical. But when you say he died for my sin, when he was on that cross, he was thinking about me. He was loving me. He was buried to take away my sin. He was raised again the third day to justify me. That's no longer history. That's reality. And history will not save you. But the reality of the resurrected Christ will save you. I read every gospel this morning about the resurrection. And I wrote down two things that just absolutely thrilled me. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees the validity that he is God. Amen. Hear me. Every other religious leader who has died is still dead. But Jesus Christ is alive. Therefore, he is the only God. There is no other God. His resurrection gives validity to the fact that he is God. Second, his resurrection not only gives validity, but it guarantees that I will rise from the grave. It guarantees his grace in my life. You see, if Jesus is still dead, this whole thing is a hoax this morning. But since Jesus is alive, living and loving, what he has done has guaranteed that if you'll turn away from your work and place your trust in him and his work, and embrace that by faith, the living Jesus will live in your life. And though one day you may physically die, there is coming a day there'll be a wonderful resurrection for you and you will not stay in the tomb and you will not go to hell and you will not live away from God, but you will live with God on the basis of his resurrection. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's wrong with my first birth? I was born in sin. What if I don't get born again? I'll have to go to hell. What does it cost to get born again? Too expensive for you to pay. So Jesus paid it all. One moment of time when the blood was shed, totally paid for your gift. How can I have the gift? Just admit you're going the wrong direction. Place your trust and total faith in Christ and Christ alone and personally ask him to come live in your life. Now I want to ask you upstairs and down, has that ever happened to you? You say, I think so, that's not good enough. You say, I hope so, that's not good enough. You see, your soul is going to live somewhere forever and if there's anything you want to be certain of, you want to be certain that your soul is on its way to heaven. You don't want to hope so. You don't want to think so. You don't want to wish so. You say, preacher, can I know this? Look at one last verse and I'm finished this morning. Look at the gospel of John chapter number one and notice the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I started in the gospel of John. I'll end there. Look in verse 11. Here's what he said. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Would you look up a moment? Nobody can make you receive Jesus. Nobody can force you to be born again. But if you choose not to be born again and leave this service, you need to understand as you go to your car, you're still on your way to hell. I did not say that. Jesus did. For he's the one who told the truth. But now look in verse 12. But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking at you and telling you that when I was a young man, my father was preaching. While he was preaching, he was preaching on hell. And as I sat listening to him, I realized I was his son, but I was not God's son. And that day, 
as he invited people to receive Christ. I did not receive my Father for salvation. I did not receive the church, the sacraments, communion, catechism. I received the Lord Jesus Christ. He entered my life. He took away my sin. He put my name down in his eternal book. And I don't think this morning I'm going to heaven. I'm absolutely certain that if I died now, I'd go to heaven. How do I know that? 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that? Good friend, when you get saved by the grace of God and you have a birth, there's a registration. That registration is called the book of life. I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina. You can find the record at the Guilford County Courthouse. It's proof positive that I was brought into this world. Now, you can try to get a passport, but you're not going to get one without proof of your birth. You're not going to get into heaven without proof that you've had a second birth. That proof is the book of God known as the Lamb's book of life. God says, whoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Therefore, you must know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your name is in the book of life. Now, I want to ask you a question upstairs and down. If Jesus Christ came this morning and he read the names publicly of everybody in this building that is born again. And he said, stand to your feet, come stand with me, I'm taking you to heaven right now, would he read your name? And then he said, if I did not read your name, your name is not in my book, you may be religious, but you've never been born again. I'm taking all these that were in my book to heaven, but I'm sorry because you were not born again, today on Easter Sunday you'll have to go to hell. Now, everybody in this room knows the answer to this. Can you prove from this book that your name is in the book of life? If your answer is no, I'm going to beg you and beseech you and plead with you today to receive Jesus. I close with this. A dignified back black man came through the door one night and I shook his hand. I said, sir, have you been born again? I appreciated his answer. He said, no, I have not. I said, could I take a Bible and show you how? He said, yes, I'd like that. We sat down and I went over what I taught you. Sin, sentence, sacrifice, salvation in Jesus Christ alone. I said, sir, would you like to receive Jesus Christ? And he said these words, that's too easy. I said, sir, don't you think God wants children to go to heaven? He said, well, I guess. I said, then why would God make it hard? God did not make it hard. Man made it hard. The gospel is simple. I said, now let me do something for you. And I went over to a whiteboard and I wrote down, I said, tell me how you could get anything out of life. If, if you wanted a car, a house, whatever you wanted, he said, well, you could buy it. I wrote B-U-I. He said, you could work for it. I wrote W-O-R-K. He said, you could rent or lease it. I wrote rent or lease. He said, you could steal it, but it's not smart. I wrote steal. And he said, I guess somebody could give it to you as a gift. And I wrote G-I-F-T. I said, now let's go back to salvation. Can you buy salvation? He said, I think so. I said, how much does it cost? He said, it doesn't make sense, preacher. Mark it off. I did. I went to work. I said, do you think you can work to go to heaven? He said, well, when I was a boy, I was taught your good works go on one side, your bad works go on the other. And if your good works outweigh well, your bad works, you'll get in. Otherwise, you won't. I said, well, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. But I said, how many good works have you done? He said, I don't know. I said, how many bad works have you done? He said, I'm not keeping count. I said, you're in big trouble. He said, mark that off. I marked it off. I went down to rent dash lease and I said, sir, if you go to heaven, you probably don't want to stay by the month. He said, mark it off. I got down to steal and he looked at me. He said, mark it off. <laughs> I circled gift and sat down. The man looked at me and he said, that is so simple, but it's got to be right. I said, sir, this book says it is right. Would you like the gift? He said, I sure would. He bowed his head. He didn't join a church. He didn't start giving tons of money. He probably doesn't know all the Bible, but he bowed his head. He opened his heart and he said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and worthy of hell, but I want your gift. Come in my life. And the man looked up at me and said these words, it works. And I'm telling you today, because of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, he still works. And he is ready to save you today. Is your name in the book of life? If your answer is no or I don't know, this morning I'm going to help you receive it. Let's bow our heads together, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around.